Okay, let's uh, pray together and then we'll look at our Bible study this evening. Father, thank you for your kindness and mercy. Lord, I pray that as we spend some time together in your word tonight, that we might be encouraged and strengthened to be the people that you desire us to be. Lord, as you speak, may we hear and may we heed the truth of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is possible to be too familiar with the truth because familiarity breeds contempt. So it is possible from time to time to be a little too familiar with certain things because you tend to take it for granted. And I think grace is one of those things. Because we continuously talk about grace and salvation by grace alone, and so forth, that we can fall into the trap of thinking of grace as being commonplace. It's pedestrian, it's ordinary. Instead of understanding, grace is always an extraordinary thing. Grace is anything but commonplace. It's very uncommon. It is unmerited. It is undeserved favor. And it is the most extraordinary thing. The danger is we begin to think of it in terms of that which is to be expected or worse, that it's something that is owed to us. Even though we understand that the the concept is that it is unmerited, it's undeserved favor. God giving us what we have no expectation for, that we have no right to, but it's the gift of His mercy, it's the gift of His kindness. And Because it is never owed, because it is unexpected, it is always a surprising thing. And so we began a couple of weeks ago looking at an Old Testament example of God's surprising grace. So we'll continue to that tonight in the book of Jonah. You remember that Jonah was a prophet from Galilee, and he was called by God to take the message of God's judgment to the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. And Jonah was not thrilled with that assignment. The Assyrians were known as a vile, wicked people. They were known for their cruelty. And when God said, go to Nineveh, go to the capital city of this Assyrian Empire and preach a message of judgment, he wasn't too keen on that. He didn't want to go. And we know from the reading the story, it's not that he was afraid. It's not he didn't want to go there because they're a vile people and they're wicked and vicious and he's afraid something's going to happen to him. The reason he didn't want to go is because he was afraid God would be gracious to them. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh and preach there because he was afraid that God would act like God and be gracious. And he didn't want that to happen. So, instead of going to Nineveh, he went down to Joppa and paid for passage to go to Tarshish, which is north of Spain. He determined he was going to go as far away from God's assignment as he could possibly go. He's going to the one place on earth that was as as far as he could conceive away from Nineveh. He tried to run, but you know how that turned out. The severe grace of God tracked him down. And God hurled a great storm onto the sea. And the boat was being tossed about. It's at the point it's about to break up and the the sailors are crying out to their gods and that doesn't seem to be doing any good and they're trying to figure out how in the world has this happened. And through a series of events they come to discover that Jonah is the problem. So they confront Jonah. They, they find out that he was called to go to Nineveh and he didn't want to go there and, and he booked passage on their ship and that's why all this has come about. And so what was Jonah's solution? It wasn't, let's go back to Joppa and I'll head to Nineveh. He said, throw me overboard. Because Jonah would rather die than do the will of God. Now think about that. The man of God 
would rather die than do the work of God. That's where Jonah was. Jonah was a prophet. Jonah was a man upon whom the blessing of God had rested. He was someone called of God to take his message and he would rather die than do the thing God called him to do. But God is gracious. God spared his life. In fact, God graciously brought him to repentance. But you remember how he brought him to repentance. The severe grace of God. And severe because sometimes the grace of God is not pleasant. Because the work of grace is God doing in us what is right for us and for His glory. And sometimes that's painful. Like spending three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish. But in that process, Jonah's brought to repentance. I guess if you're spending three days and nights in the belly of the fish, there's not much else to do but contemplate your choices, your life choices. And, and, and what are you going to do about that? And what about your future and so forth? So in the process of that, Jonah's brought to repentance. And then once he came to repentance, once he discovered the Lord is the means of salvation, that the Lord is salvation, then he is delivered up on dry land. And that's where we're going to pick up the story. So our text is Jonah chapter 3. And we're going to look at the entire chapter. It's just ten verses. Jonah chapter 3. As we work our way through this third chapter, we're going to note a surprising revelation, a definite reversal, and an amazing revival. First, a surprising revelation. It's there in verses 1 and 2 of Jonah chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Now, I want you to think for a minute, what shape would Jonah be in at this point? I just try to picture it in your mind. Three days and three nights in the belly of a fish. He, he must have been white those gases working on his system. And then, how did he get on dry land? I mean, yeah, it's one thing to say, then after this experience, he was delivered to dry land. How was he delivered? It's in verse 10 of chapter 2. The Lord gave the word and he vomited him up on the land. So he's been three days and nights in the belly of a fish and then he's vomited up on the land. So, I mean, I picture him just white, seaweed wrapped all around him, and I can't even begin to imagine the smell. He's in rough shape. And God comes to him. Now, what is God going to do when he comes to him? What? How would you respond if you're God, and this is your servant, and you've placed your hand on him, and you've placed your blessing on him, and you called him to go and preach to Nineveh, and he tried to run away as far as he could, how would you respond to him? What would you do that now that he's in this position? I know what I would have done with this rebel. I think I'd have said, son, I've delivered you, but you've made yourself unusable. You have forfeited the right to be used by me. But that's not God's response. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And look at what he said. Arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Now, flip back to chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for, the evil, for their evil has come up before me. 
It's the same call. That's grace. That's surprising. That's merciful. God comes to this rebellious servant with the exact same call. Arise and go to Nineveh. Unearned, unmerited favor. Now again, familiarity breeds contempt. We're familiar with those terms. We use them all the time. In fact, we are so conditioned that every time we hear grace, it automatically pops in our mind. Unmerited favor. Undeserved favor. But do we ever let that really sink in? Do, do we ever really stop and think about what that means? If you see it in this context, if you see it in the context of God coming a second time with this command, this offer to this prophet to be used of God, to be an instrument in the hand of God, that makes it more concrete. That, that, that puts some meat on the bones and you begin to understand what it means that God is gracious, what it means that God is merciful. He doesn't deserve this at all. He deserved to die. To, to act in the way he did was a, a direct rebellion against the command of God. And this is from someone who knew better. Remember James said, not many of you should desire to be a teacher because there's a stricter judgment that comes with that. So this isn't like your run-of-the-mill Israelite failing to do something God commanded him to do. This is a prophet of God who repelled. This is a prophet of God who ran. And yet God came to him in grace and mercy and gave him the same call. God still was going to use him. God still wanted him to be his instrument. This is the grace of God. He is the God of the second chance. And aren't you grateful for that? Now here's the question that comes out of that. As so you're thinking about God being merciful and giving him the second chance, is he unique or is this standard procedure for God? Is, is Jonah unique in getting a second chance? Or has God done this kind of thing before? Well, think about Abraham. If you go back and read in Genesis chapters 11 and 12 at the beginning of his story, you find that they were idol worshippers down in Ur of the Chaldees. And God was working in their family. And, and you read in the end of chapter 11 that Abram's family left Ur to go to Canaan. They didn't go to Canaan. They went to Haran and settled in. Hundreds of miles from Canaan. But then chapter 12 begins, the word of the Lord came to Abram and he calls him a second time. Leave there and go where I told you to go. God's grace. God's mercy. There wasn't anything in Abram that, that made him a candidate. He comes from a family of idol worshippers. He lives in a distant place and God calls him in love and grace and mercy. He doesn't go where he said, come on, go. And he doesn't go to Canaan. He stops. And all the indications are he settled in. He would have stayed there. But God came a second time and called in chapter 12 and said, come on, go to the land that I'm going to show you. Well, what about Moses? Moses too. Listen to Acts chapter 7. When he was 40 years old, Steve, this is Stephen's sermon as he gives the history of the people of Israel. When he was 40 years old, he came, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. What was the result of that? Spent another 40 years, this time on the backside of the desert, until God came calling a second time at that bush that burned but was not consumed. God was gracious. God was merciful. What about Peter? Peter. 
Lord, I'll follow you anywhere. Lord, I'll do anything. Lord, I'll die for you. Then he denied him. Three times in a single night. He, he denied him in the face of a teenage girl, a servant. But after the resurrection, the Lord came to him, appeared to him. And then we have that wonderful scene in John 21 where Jesus is saying to Peter, Do you love me? Well, Lord, you know I love you. Well, feed my sheep. Peter, do, do, you, do you love me? Lord, you, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you really love me? And then he was grieved. Why? We don't understand it in English. You have to go to the original language. Jesus said, Peter, do you agape me? Do you have this great, highest kind of love for me? And his response was, Lord, you know I have a warm regard for you. He used a different word. He used the word filio. Well, feed my sheep. Do you love me, agape? Well, you know I feel a. Well, feed my sheep. Peter, do you have a warm regard for me? Now he's mad to him. Lord, you know I do. Feed my sheep. God is gracious and merciful. He is the God of the second chance. More than that, He is the God of the second, third, fourth, and the 900th chance. Now why does that matter? Any of you ever started and then didn't finish? Any of you ever in your life, in your spiritual life and development, ever said yes to the will of God and He only went so far and then it kind of fell apart? What is the Lord's response? We're grateful that God is gracious. But understand, the second chance is always a matter of grace. It's not earned. It's not deserved. It isn't owed to you. And not everyone gets a second chance. Remember, Nadab and Abihu, sons of Aaron, called to be priests, trained to be priests, dedicated to be priests, and they mixed strange fire on the altar and the fire came out and consumed them. There was no second chance. What about Uzzah? Trained to transport the ark of God. And of course, it was very specific. Use these poles, carry it. They put it on an ox cart. This will be easier. Doing the same thing, Lord, just easier. And when it tottered a little bit, Uzzah reached up his hand to steady it. Dead. On the spot. No second chance. What about Ananias and Sapphira? They lied on their offering envelope. God struck him dead. There was no second chance. A second chance, we're grateful that God is merciful. But we must understand that's holy of grace. He doesn't know us that second chance. He doesn't know us the third or the fourth or the fifth or the one hundredth or the six hundredth chance. And when it comes, and when the Lord graciously gives that to us, we need to recognize it for what it is. It is the grace of God. And the grace of God alone. There is this surprising revelation as God graciously comes to this wayward prophet and gives him the exact same call. That leads to a definite reversal. Verses 3 and 4. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city. Call out against it the message that I will tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. And the implication of the text is, this was immediate obedience. You don't have to think about it. Well, I would hope not. After what he'd been through, after the experience and God gives him another chance, he immediately decided he would do that. Back in chapter 1 and verse 3, the word of the Lord came to him. We read, but Jonah. Here we read, 
Jonah arose, and he went according to the word of the Lord. Now, there's nothing fishy about that. So I couldn't, couldn't resist. It's understandable why he would, because of the experience he'd been through, because he had experienced the grace of God, because he understood that God had every right for him to die. God's judgment would have been holy and righteous if he had not survived. And there God has given him another chance. His disobedience brought the judgment of God. Now his obedience brings the blessing of God. The key is that he was called to deliver the Lord's message and he arose, went to Nineveh, and he preached the message that God gave to him. Jonah's message was God's message. That means it comes with the power and the anointing of God. It's not about his intelligence. It's not about his passion. It's not about his eloquence. It's not about sophistication. It's about obedience. When he was obedient, God did a gracious work in the city of Nineveh. This goes back to what we talked about Sunday. It's about doing God's work God's way. He didn't go in his own strength. He went in the blessing of the Lord. He didn't go with his own message. He meant he went with the message of the Lord. So there's this definite reversal. There is this change inside the heart of this wayward prophet. But that brings us to the final thing, which is, is this amazing revival recorded in verse 5 down through verse 10, the, the largest part of this chapter. He went to the great city, this three days journey in breadth. It's this large city. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey into the city, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh. And he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and set in ashes. He issued a proclamation and published it throughout Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, Taste anything, let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence of his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they had turned from their evil ways, God relented of the disaster that He had said He would do to them, and He did not do it. So there's this great revival that comes as a result of the preaching of Jonah. The entire city is transformed from the lowest to the highest, from the stable to the palace. And what happened? They believed what they believed. Well, they didn't believe. It wasn't that they believed Jonah. They believed God. And the word that's translated here, believe, it's the word that means they put trust in. They, they gave allegiance to. Um, it means to be firm in conviction. So it's not a surface level thing. It's not a matter that, that they were afraid because of the judgment. They trusted God. That's clear in the text. This is not uh, reading into the text. What the text says is there was a great revival that came to the city of Nineveh and it was from the lowest person to the highest person. It, it was from the man on the street to the king on his throne. As the king got off his throne, took off his robe, put on sackcloth, and set in ashes. Those are signs of humiliation. Those are acts of repentance. And it came about as the result of the preaching of the message that God gave to Jonah. 
So note this path for revival. There was the faithful preaching and the faithful hearing of God's word. There was belief, there was trust, there was reliance upon God, His person. And then there were acts of genuine repentance that followed that in verses 6 through 8. And then we're no, it's made very clear in verse 8, there is a turning away from very specific sins. Your evil ways, that means wicked, contemptible ways. The violence of your hand, the violent, destructive, aggressive, it's a word that is used for plunder. Turn away from all that. Who knows, the Lord may relent and not bring this disaster on us. Here's the grace of God in verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned, and that is the word that's used in the Old Testament for repentance, it means to come back to. When they turn, returned, God relented of the disaster that He had said He would do to them, and He did not do it. There's another of the problems we have in the book of Jonah. We, you know, we said one of the problems was the great fish, and people said, well, this must be some fairy tale, this must be some allegory, because you know, how, could, how could a fish swallow a man, and how could he stay alive in those three days and nights on it? But here's another. What about God relenting? For some translations, God repented. How, how do we square that with the rest of Scripture? Because you know, whenever we read something in Scripture and we try to understand what it means, we have to take in the whole counsel of God when we're trying to understand it. So how do we square Jonah chapter 3 and verse 10 with Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19? Because in Numbers 23 and 19 we read, God is not a man that He should lie, nor a son of man that He should change His mind. Has He said and will not do it? Or has He spoken and He will not fulfill it? God doesn't do that. So if God doesn't repent, God doesn't change His mind, how do we, how do we reconcile that with what happens here? And, and it's not an easy answer. Because it's not a matter that you can go and say, well, I looked up that word, relent, and it doesn't really mean... It means relented. It means changed his mind. So I'm, I'm not giving that easy out to say, well, that better mean what it means. You do have to understand that it's using language for, that we can grasp and understand. It's using human language to describe something in God. But I think it's also crucial that you understand what is he relenting of? He's not going to bring the judgment. But if you look at the message, I think the message all along was, if you will repent, I'm not going to do this. Where did they get the idea? Where did the king get the idea? If we do this, if we show repentance, if we do this, perhaps the Lord will not bring this. Where did he get that idea? If he hadn't heard it. So the Lord... It's not that he changed his mind. He's fulfilling his word. There was repentance, so he spares them that judgment. The word that's translated relent, most of the time that it's used in the Old Testament, it means to comfort, to have compassion. So the Lord had compassion on these wicked, vile, corrupt people. I think that's clearly the meaning of the text because that explains chapter 4. That explains what we read at the beginning of chapter 4 and Jonah's response. Go ahead and look at it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry. So the Lord is gracious to him. He, he doesn't kill him and he lets him... Continue to serve him. He gives him the same call and he goes and the Lord brings this sweeping great revival 
that, that changes everything from the king on down, and there is this massive revival, and his reaction is exceedingly angry. Verse 2. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. See, this is why I didn't want to come here in the first place. Because I know you and I know what you're like and you're just the type of God who would be gracious and merciful. And I didn't want that to happen. Now, here again is another example of the greatness of our God. Because He used this wayward stubborn, and I'll say wicked prophet to accomplish great good. Was Jonah's heart where it should have been for him to preach this message? No. But God honors the preaching of His Word regardless of the motivation of the one delivering that message. We know that from the New Testament. Paul said, there are those who are preaching the gospel because they want it to harm me. There are those who are preaching the gospel with impure motive. But I thank God because the message is preached. There's an Old Testament example of that. Jonah's heart was not right in the preaching of the gospel. God blessed it anyway. And you need to be grateful for that. Because I know your pastor and I know his heart is bad. And if God's blessing was dependent on your pastor's heart always being right, that's not a good thing. God is gracious. God is merciful. And despite the weaknesses and the failings of your pastor and despite the weaknesses and the failings of any preacher of God, God is powerful enough to accomplish His purpose through weak, flawed, broken, corrupt vessels. That's the grace and the mercy of God. And so the grace of God overflows in this little Old Testament book. Grace is not a New Testament thing. It's a Bible thing. It runs throughout the whole. Grace has always been God's message. Grace has always been the means by which God blesses the people and enters into relationship with them. And that's made abundantly clear in this passage. This chapter. Chapter 3 is the great miracle chapter of the book of Jonah, not chapter 2. A great fish swallowing a man and keeping him alive three days in the belly, that's not a big deal. The big deal is God's transformation of a vile, wicked, corrupt people and bringing revival to them through a flawed vessel for His own glory. The grace of God ultimately always is to the glory and wonder of our God. So in this story, we behold the wonder of His grace in changing the heart of a wayward prophet and transforming a wicked city. Thank God for His grace and the wonder of His grace. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the glory of this message. I thank you for the wonder of this story as it just thunders home to us the glory of your grace. The wonder of your grace to flog broken vessels to those who are deserving of your wrath and judgment. You choose to be merciful and you choose to be gracious. 
Father, thank you for reminding us of that this evening. And I pray that it inspires us. I pray that it compels us to be gracious to those around us. To be quick to speak of the grace and the mercy of God to others. That it drives us in being open and quick to tell the reason for the hope that is in us. It's not because of anything in us. It's not because we deserve it. It's not because we've got it coming to us. It's not because it's owed to us. We have hope because our God is a merciful God, a gracious God. Because God is merciful and gracious to us, we can assure anyone God is gracious and merciful. If they will look to Him in faith, they will find life eternal and life abundant. Father, make us instruments of Your grace and use us for Your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. If you would please take your first sheet.